sex, he wants us to enjoy it, and when we do it his way, it's much better. Uh, last week, we talked about pursuing your spouse and, and pursuing them in the way that they need. And today, we're dealing with dealing with your past. You know, sex is much more than a physical act. There's a, there's a lot of emotional and mental sides to it. And so if your past, if you have some issues there, if, if you think sex is dirty or you associate it with guilt or pain, it's going to be hard for you to enjoy it. And so you need to deal with issues from your past, even if your issues are just not ever having conversations about that. And so there's a great example of, of a man in the, uh, in the Bible. His name is David. David had some sin in his life, some past that he needed to deal with. And we're going to see what, uh, what he did. Uh, I'm, I'm got, uh, I've just kind of got to go through his story. So I don't have a specific scripture to point you to right now. But I, I want to start with this thought that, that David was chosen. You see, what happened was the nation of Israel, uh, they just had a, a series of rulers. Uh, and then they said, you know what, we want a king. All the other countries out there, they have kings, and so we want a king too. And the first king that they had was a guy named Saul, and Saul was king. And then at the beginning of his reign, Saul was following God, doing what God wanted him to. But as it kind of went along, he turned away from God. And so God said, you know what, I'm going to raise up a new king. And as, as God was looking at, at who he wanted to choose as king, the, the main characteristic that God was looking for, God said, I want a man after my own heart. God said, I, I want someone who is passionate for me, someone who, who wants to please me. And out of all the people on the earth at the time, God said, David, that's the man. David was chosen by God because of his heart and his passion for God. Now, today, I think, what about us? Do we have that desire? Are we passionate for God? Do we want to please God in every part of our lives? That's something that we need to think about and something we have to figure out on our own. Even though he had a passion for God and wanted to please God, David was still human. And so we see that there was a commission of sin, that he committed a sin. In 2 Samuel 11, it tells a story of what happened with David. After David was chosen by God, there was a, a huge long period of time, and then David became king. And as he became king, he started to expand the borders of the nation of Israel, and, and he got a palace. And, and in 2 Samuel 11, it tells us about the sin that David committed. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a beautiful woman bathing. Uh, the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to, uh, to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So there's a lot of stuff in there. I want to deal with it just a little bit at a time. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go to war, uh, during that time period, you know, during the winter, a lot of times armies took the winters off. And so at springtime, they would go back out to battle. And so it says in the spring, when kings go to war, uh, the army was out. They were fighting the battles, and David was at home. He was not at all where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be out with the troops fighting the battles, but instead he stayed home. And so somewhere in there, David gets in trouble because he's in the wrong place. He's in a place he shouldn't be. David, one night, can't sleep. For whatever reason, he, just, he gets up and he goes up onto his rooftop and, and the king's uh, palace was going to be the highest building in the area. And so he was looking down. And David's walking along his rooftop and he sees this woman bathing. Now, David is not at fault for just seeing this woman bathing. He's looking down and she's up on her rooftop or whatever, and he sees her. He's not in trouble for that. But it says then that he saw that the woman was beautiful. He took a second look. Sometimes temptation is just right out there in front of us, and if we would just walk away, life would be better. Too many times, what happens? We take a second look at that temptation. And for David, that's exactly what happened. He saw her, he stared, he lusted, he wanted to be with her. 
And so he takes, uh, gets one of his servants and says, who is that? Go find out who that is. And so the servant goes, finds out who it is, comes back and tells the king, King David, isn't this Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah? Uriah is one of your best soldiers. I mean, this is his wife. And the servant's almost implying, David, she's married. Go into one of your wives. You know, go be with her if you're so fired up right now. Leave this lady alone. But David ignores his servant. And so he sends him and says, go bring her to me. And so she came and he slept with her. Now, it doesn't tell us what he was thinking or feeling then. Uh, she goes back home. But then uh, sometime later, she sends word to David and says, I'm pregnant. You know, here's a man after God's own heart, a man who is passionate for God. And when he is confronted with a temptation, instead of walking away or singing a praise to God or taking a cold shower, he takes a second look and he gives into temptation and he sins. You know, sometimes I think we look at that and think, well, how can this guy who is so fired up for God, how can, I mean, the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. How could he do something like this? And I think about that and I say, you know what? At some point, we need to face it. We are all sinners too. At some point, we need to look at our own lives and say, you know what? Today, I am incredibly on fire for God. I am ready. Me and God, we are all that. And then tomorrow I go, I don't even look like a Christian. Forget about a fired up Christian. I, I don't even look at all like what Christ wants me to look like. You know, when I start looking at myself in those ways, it's easier for me to say, okay, I understand what David has did. Don't agree with it, but I understand. Because you know, there are times I'm on fire for God and times that, that I'm not. So instead of honestly dealing with the situation, instead of honestly dealing with the guilt and the shame of his sin, instead, David tried to cover it up. He tried to cover it up. And so what he did was, it was pretty simple. You know, he's the king. The guys are off at war. Uh, he sends and has Uriah come back from the battle and to give him a report on, on how the battle's going. And so David talks to Uriah. Uriah says, okay, here's what's going on. David says, okay, well, thanks, Uriah. I appreciate that. Tell you what, why don't you go on, go home to your wife, and then we'll, we'll get you back out to the war pretty soon. And so Uriah goes and goes down to the servants' quarters and sleeps there. And David finds out about this. He says, what's going on? Uriah's reply was, was pretty simple. You know, he's like, hey, all my fellow soldiers, they're out fighting the battle. It wouldn't be right for, for me to go home and be with my wife when these guys are out here doing this. They're, they're fighting for this country. You know, they're fighting for God. They're missing out on all of these things. I can't do that. And so David's going, dang, what am I going to do? Got it. He invites Uriah to eat with him that night. Hey, Uriah, before you go back to the battle, I'll tell you what, why don't you stay here and eat with me? And so David sits him down at a king's banquet table, and he, David gets him drunk. You know, I don't know what he, if he says to his servants, hey, give him the best wine. When his cup is empty, make sure that thing's full. Whatever it takes, get Uriah drunk. And at the end of the meal, Uriah's drunk, and David says, hey, Uriah, go home, be with your wife. And Uriah goes and sleeps in the servants' quarters again. And so now David's really in trouble. And so David writes a message to the commander of the army. And he has Uriah deliver the message to the commander of the army. It was sealed up so Uriah wouldn't see what was in there. Your, David just basically says to the commander, hey, I need you to go and attack that city. Stop the siege, attack the walls. When you do, you need to put Uriah right there in the front of the battle. And so most of the time when people were sieging cities, they stayed away from the walls because attacking the walls, you lose a lot of soldiers that way. But the commander does what David says, and he puts Uriah right in front of the battle. And so when they go and attack the city wall, uh, uh, a, a lady drops this big old stone and kills Uriah. And so the commander of the army sends word back to David and says, hey, Uriah's dead. And David's response is basically, well, that's what happens in war. Yeah, it stinks to be him. Bathsheba goes through the period of mourning that's required, and then she goes, and David takes her as, as his wife, and then later she bears a son. David covers up his sin. We cover up as well, don't we? When there are things that we do wrong, when there are times that we break God's law, we cover up. 
Sometimes we deflect and say, well, what, what I did wasn't really wrong considering the situation. I mean, if you knew everything was going on, you would agree that you probably would have chosen the same thing. It's really not that big a deal. Or sometimes we just flat out lie. No, I didn't do that. Or sometimes we try and hide it. Or, or sometimes we stuff it down and we think that, that if no one else sees it, then we can get away with our sin. And we cover it up and we may not have the power that David did and, and be able to do it that way, but we cover up our sins. And David covered up his sin up until the point that he was, uh, had a period of confrontation. That he was confronted for his sin. Uh, one of the prophets of God, his name was Nathan. Uh, God spoke to Nathan, and, and Nathan went and spoke to David. And Nathan told this incredible story about this guy who misused his power. And David gets angry about this story that he's hearing. And says, that guy needs to be punished. And Nathan says, David, you're the man. You're the man. You had all this power and glory that God gave you, and you misused your power, you misused your authority, and you took someone else's wife. You're the man. You may have thought that you got away with it, but God knows better. He saw what you did. And Nathan confronted David. Now it takes some courage. I know God's like sending you and stuff, <laughs> but if you're a prophet and you go and tell someone the king, the king has the power to put you to death. You can just say off with his head. If he didn't like the message... Man, you could just be dead. Confronting someone is always, can always be a difficult proposition. But God's word says that we need to do that. God's word says that we need to confront people. If, if we see someone in sin, man, we, we just can't let that keep going on. If we see someone that's, that's continually dishonoring God in some way, and, and there's someone that we know, they're a friend of ours, we need to have a conversation with them. Ephesians 4.15 says this, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Speaking the truth in love. And the problem with confronting people is this. Uh, a lot of times we don't like to do it because we think if I go and confront that person, they're going to get mad at me. And I don't know, maybe they'll leave God or leave the church, but at the very least, they'll be mad at me and there'll be, there'll be a, a fight. And so we back off away from it. Or sometimes we don't confront people because we know that, that if I say, hey, I, I've seen this in your life and, and man, it, it's not right, they're going to look at me and say, who are you to be telling me anything? I know all kinds of stuff about you and the way you behave. And so we, we get afraid and we're fearful to have those conversations. But the Bible says we need to speak the truth. We need to do it in love. We need to make sure that we're not saying, hey, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. If you don't stop, God's just going to zap you right now. We need to go and lovely and say, hey, you know what? I know that you're trying to follow God, and I know that you're struggling with this because I see you struggling with it. And I'll tell you what, this is not God's will that you're, that you're involved in this. And so uh, there, there's got to be a change that happens. And, and if you need help, I can help you. I can come along beside you. I'm not trying to beat you down because I love you. I want to make sure you stop doing this. And we're called to speak the truth and speak it in love. And when Nathan confronted David... He told David, hey, here's what God knows what you did. And because of what you've done, because you've, you've hit it like you have, you're going to have to deal with the consequences. You're going to have to deal with the consequences to your sin. And so for David, God was pretty upfront. Here's the consequences. Number one, you're going to lose the child. This, this, this baby that, that's, to be bo that, that's born uh, from Bathsheba, the child's going to die. Second is, uh, your kingdom, you're going to lose your kingdom for a while. You get it back, but for a while, um, it's going to be done. It's, it's, it's gone. David had to deal with the consequences to his sins. You see, God sees what we're doing. He knows what we're doing. And just because we think that we can hide it and get away from it for a while, we think, oh, no one's ever going to know. No one saw me do that. God sees in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, it says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. You know, God says, I know what you did, and when you walk outside of my principles, my guidelines, my commands, when you walk outside of those the consequences are this. 
God doesn't want us to not sin because he wants us to not have fun. God wants us to not sin because when we sin, there's consequences to it. And even if we think that we can hide and get away from it, God knows and he sees. And so what happened was Nathan confronted David, told him what the consequences were going to be, and David had a confession. He had a confession of sin. He went off by himself, and he spent some time worshiping God. You know, as the king, his reaction could have been, you know what, Nathan? I hear your words, and I don't want to hear them anymore. Off with his head. But instead, David chose to humble his heart and go and confess to God. And probably one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible is Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is, is the psalm that David wrote to confess his sin to God. I'm not going to read the whole thing right here, right now, but there's pieces that you need to hear and you need to understand what David's doing in this situation. Here's what he says. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and, and cleanse me from my sin. David goes to God and says, God, you're right and I'm wrong. I know I've sinned. I know how, how awful it is. And I can't undo it. I can't take away that night with Bathsheba. I can't take away sending the note. I can't bring your right back. God, you know my sins. Please blot out my transgressions. Wipe them out. Cleanse me from my sin. And I think David was so intense about that because he knew the consequences that he was dealing with. It wasn't just this other stuff. But for the last six to nine months, David had been hiding his sin and listen to what it did to him. He says in verse 3, my sin is always before me. I'm constantly picturing what I did. I know it was wrong, and it's there all the time. I wake up, and it's there. I go to sleep, and it's there. Things happen during the day, and it reminds me my sin is always there. I can't deal with it anymore. Verse 8, let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. David says, my sin, it's weighing me down. It's crushing my bones, God. There, uh, please help me to rejoice again. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart. God, my heart feels dirty and black and filthy. Forgive me my sins and create in me a pure heart, one that is back to what it used to be. When I was so on fire for you, when I, when I was passionate for you, that was a good time and help me to get back to that. God, renew a steadfast spirit in me. God, every day I, I don't feel like I can make it through the next few hours. I don't feel like that, that there's any hope for the future. God, renew a steadfast spirit in me, a strong spirit where I, I, I know that you're there. I know that we're solid. Do not cast me from your presence. God, you chose me. There's nothing great about me. I, I just loved you, and you chose me, and you, you did all these great things for me, and you've seen the wickedness of me, and God, don't send me away. Don't kick me out of your presence. I need to be in your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David had seen firsthand what would happen in those situations. King Saul had the Holy Spirit on him. And when King Saul was doing the stuff that God wanted him to, God's spirit was there. And when, when Saul turned away from God, God took his spirit away from Saul. And David saw that and said, God, don't do that to me. I need your spirit. I need you every day of my life. God, I, I, I can't make it through this life on my own. God, don't take your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. God, there's been no joy. Over the last half year, over the last nine months, there's been no joy in my life. Every day I wake up and I think, God, I am sorry. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I can't make it through this life on my own. God, I'm sorry. Let your spirit sustain me. I don't know what sins you have in your past. I don't know what you're dealing with. 
But I know that if you think that you can just deny those things in your past, if you think you can just stuff them down, if you think you could just run from them or hide from them, you might be able to do that for a time. But if you think you can keep stuffing that stuff in your past, you're wrong. It's going to show up sometime. It is going to bubble to the surface at some point in your life. It may take months. It may take years. It may take decades. But that stuff is going to come back up at some point. And you're missing out on all the in-between time where you could be back and right with God. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his sins doesn't prosper. You don't prosper when you hide your sins. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. We find mercy from God when we go to him and confess. Because guess what? He knows already. He knows what we've done. And when it says to confess your sins, it doesn't mean stand up here and tell everybody, hey, here's all my stuff. It means you go and you find someone that you can confess to, someone that you can get that off your chest. I know that when we think about confessing our sins to somebody else, there's a lot of fear there. I know sometimes we are just terrified because what will they think of me? What will they say about me? What will they do? And we have so much fear that, that keeps us from, I'm not saying you tell everybody, I'm finding you, you find that person that you can share with and say, you know what? This has been eating at me for a long time and I, I just need to tell you. Sometimes we have a fear that that person will leave us. They just can't handle that truth about us. And you know what? Maybe that's a good thing. If they can't handle that truth about you, maybe that's a good thing that they leave you. And you'll know what type of a friendship you really had. But more often what happens is when you have the courage to say, man, this, this is a part of my life and I hate it and it's not what I want, but, but here's what I've done. More often what happens is it draws that other person closer to you. And they say, well, you think you're a mess? <laughs> you think you're a train wreck? <laughs> That's what you've done? Well, well, let me tell you what I've done. And we realize that the people that are friends with and we thought that they were perfect and all those things, they're just as big a mess as we are. They need, God, they need God's mercy and grace and forgiveness just as much as we do. When you confess your sin, it, it, it's hard to say those words. But I'll tell you what, then you find out that you're not alone. And then you get to experience compassion. Because that's what God gave David, was compassion. He gave him grace and forgiveness. After this, we see that David had four more sons with Bathsheba. We see that David lost his kingdom for a while. That was part of the consequence. But he got it back. It was returned to him. We see that David, as you, as you read through the genealogy of Jesus, David is an ancestor of Jesus. And not only David, but also Bathsheba. When you read in Matthew, it doesn't name her by name, but, but it talks about Bathsheba being an ancestor, ancestor of Jesus. They're both in the genealogy. Beyond that, even today, today in the nation of Israel, David is one of the most celebrated heroes of the nation of, the nation of Israel after thousands of years. Not only that, but David and Bathsheba had a son. And they named him Solomon. And Solomon wrote some of our books of the Old Testament. He wrote a lot of the Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote the Song of Solomon. Out of situations like that, God can bring amazing things. That's why James 5.16, James 5.16 says kind of the same thing says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So that you may be healed. You know, some of you guys are dealing with a lot of past, a lot of history. And part of the healing process is being able to say that out loud to someone else and seeing that they can accept you for who you are. And then it's, it's this. It's believing and understanding that no matter what your sins of the past are, that God can do some amazing things in you and through you right now. And to me, that's an incredible thing. 
Because you look around this room, and there's a lot of people with a lot of sinful past. There's not a lot of saints as far as that goes in this room, okay? There's not a lot of saints up on the stage, all right? There's a lot of people with a past up here. <laughs> right now, I wish the rest of the band was here, so you would think it was them and not me. <laughs> God chose us, and we commit sins. When we cover up those sins, at some point, we need to be confronted with the truth. We have to deal with the consequences, and then we go to God. If we confess to him, we see his compassion. We still may have to deal with the consequences to our sin, but what we come to realize is that our walk with God, we experience the mercy that he gives us is so much greater. And if you have sexual sins in the past or other sins in the past, and you think there's no way that God can do anything with me, you're totally missed out on this story that, about David and Bathsheba. Chuck Swindoll in his book says this, By his sovereign grace, God can bring good out of our failures and even out of our sins. You look at what God did with them. And I believe that God didn't stop working with the Old Testament people. I believe God is active and alive and working in people's lives today. And the same God that wants to give them compassion wants to give you compassion. He wants to start over in you so that he can work through you as well. That's the God we serve. There is a consistent theme that's in the Bible. God takes broken people and does amazing things in them and through them. And he wants to do the same thing with you. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, uh, Steve and I will be available after this service, and we'd love to talk with you, uh, share with you what it means to be a follower of Christ. If you're someone that, that has some stuff in your past and you want to talk to someone, uh, we can find some people that will talk with you, uh, men or women, um, and love to, to be able to just be there and listen and, and to pray with you. But you look at who David was and what he did, and you look at our lives and see, you know, who we are and what we've done. And God's amazing grace can do amazing things. Let's pray.